Unfortunately, we've been waiting for this moment in the books of First and Second Samuel. These two books have been pretty much foreshadowing this uh, terrible event that now is given to us in Second Samuel 11. Uh, you have up to this point, though, really just a, an amazing picture of what God is accomplishing through David for the kingdom of Israel. I believe it would be fair to say that 2 Samuel 8 verse 14 is really the best summary statement of where we are at to really depict the apex of this kingdom where it says, And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. And that has really just been everything that we have seen, particularly in 2 Samuel. Once the death of Saul occurs, David has moved right on up and has been able to establish the kingdom. But if you remember in 2 Samuel, every time that it notes that David is growing stronger, there is this little parenthetical warning us that things are about to turn poorly and badly. In so chapter 3, Verses 2 through 5, the text tells us that David grew stronger and stronger. And then after saying that, it also says that he's multiplying wives. In chapter 5, verses 12 through 16, we are told that the Lord established David as king and exalted his kingdom. But his multiplying of wives is noted again. And now we come to the moment, and we are not going to be surprised that the place of David's weakness is going to be in regards to women. The place of his failure is going to be here. And that's where we're at then in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. And as we look at the life of David, we consider the sin. What we're going to be able to see is ultimately, I believe, the anatomy of spiritual failure. There is so much to learn in regards to David's fall. And really to see that this is common to all, how Satan goes about tempting David, and how that is true of us, and all of the opportunities that David had to escape that he fails to take. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. Chapter 11, verse 1, begins ultimately with ominous words. In the spring of the year, the time when the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Ramah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Already you have this ominous declaration. It's a time of the year when kings are out going to battle, where kings go and they are with their armies. And for some reason, this time David doesn't do that. In fact, when we look at the past three chapters, we see that David has been going out in war. In fact, we quoted already chapter 8, verse 14. The Lord gave victory to David wherever he goes. And this is not an offhanded comment here in verse 1 to point out this time David doesn't go. And I think what is being underscored right here, right out of the gate and picturing the beginnings of this failure, is David is not where he ought to be. David should be out there with his army. He should be out there with his men. In fact, when we get to the words of Uriah a little bit later, Uriah pretty well understands that, yet David does not. David remains back in Jerusalem. He remains back in his palace. And please remember why Israel wanted a king in the first place. All the way back in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 20, we want a king who's going to Lead us and fight our battles. Here's a chance where David could have fulfilled that purpose. To go out, to attack and give victory to Israel. And yet this time, he remains back. And I think it's important for us to consider before we move forward, just right at the outset, of something that we talked a little bit about this morning, is that this idea of idle hands, is a constant problem that God talks about. And while we may have been surprised to see that that concern was ascribed to the, the widows in 1 Timothy 5, the same concern is spoken to all humans and to all Christians. 
is that one of the things God does in giving us work and giving us things to do either secularly or for him is to help keep us from sinning. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6 where he begins, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not according with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. All right, well, what's the imitation, Paul? Because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear some among you. Walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Notice the Apostle Paul, a whole paragraph. Don't be idle. Get to work. Don't be a busy body, but be busy at something that in, in either the terms of the work of God or busy with earning a living and doing your work quietly because there is so much to be said for the idea of idle hands leading to temptation, leading us for the potential to fall. And I think that's an important thing that we keep in mind, not only for our own lives, but we ought to consider that for our children as well. We should consider that we are not doing our children any favors. We create for them hours and hours of time where they have absolutely nothing to do. That just leads to temptations. It leads to the potential for problems. And this is what I think you see being expressed here in chapter 11 and verse 1. This is a time of activity. Kings go into battle. God would have been with David to give victory wherever he goes. We see that in chapter 8. But rather than going out and doing this task and getting victory for Israel, he is just in his palace. And that sets up the sin that's about to happen. Verse 2. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman and once said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness, and then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Let's stop there in the picture. There's so much to see in this very compact, short account of the things that are going terribly wrong for David. I think it is important to note but there's nothing unusual about being on the roof. For us, we picture our roofs, and they're pitched, and to be on the roof is kind of dangerous, and that kind of thing. But remember, you're living in an ancient Near Eastern world where you don't have air conditioning. You are outside. You would be on your roof. That was quite common. The thing that David has is as being king, he has prime real estate. And so for him, the most expensive homes are higher up. That's even true even in our culture and in our land. Though we're in Florida, it's flat. If you're in California, the higher up you go a hill, the more expensive the property, the more spacious the view and the beautiful the view. Well, that's what David has, is he's able to look down upon the majority of Jerusalem, and it just so happens that he's able to walk around and because of this vantage point, be able to see Bathsheba while she's bathing. It is worthy of them that this text gives absolutely zero condemnation to Bathsheba. She's just taking a bath. And it just so happens that David happens to be on the roof. And because of the elevation of his home, he has a vantage point to be able to see what he ought not see. But I want us to notice something. What you've seen here with David 
is something that he ought not to see. But does he have a choice now at this moment about what he's going to do about that? Does he have a choice as to what he's going to do next? Because the most obvious thing to do right here is to avert your eyes, go back down into your home, and forget this ever happened. But that's not what David does. What David does is he begins to take these steps toward this sin. You will notice that we are told that as David sees that this woman is beautiful, instead of just putting this out of mind, going back about his business, he asks for an inquiry. Who is this woman? Takes a second step into this. Let me know about who she is. She's beautiful. Who is this woman that I've been able to see? And notice that the answer that the messenger gives is full of warning. Listen to his words. Is this not Bathsheba? But listen to the rest. The daughter of Eliab and the wife of Uriah. You know, this isn't, well, that's just Bathsheba over there. It's almost as if the messenger is saying, stop asking about what you're asking about. That is someone's daughter, and that is someone's wife. Stop allowing your mind to go the direction it's going, David. David, I know why you're asking, that's the wife of Uriah. That's the daughter of Elio. Or to pull in what we talked about this morning, you need to be thinking about her impurity and not the way he's concerning himself at this point. But not only does he not listen to the messenger, he goes yet a step further, verse 4, so David sent messengers and took it's interesting the wording there of taking her. It's what we've seen up to this point in David's life where the same things are said about the various women that he is taking into this harem that he is building, which God condemned the kings for doing. And yet here we see it again. He sees a beautiful woman. He ignores all the warning signs, doesn't listen to the messenger, doesn't avert his mind from what he's thinking. Instead, he sends messengers and he takes her. And I think it is important for us to observe a very important truth. Because this is the essence of sin. The essence of sin is this. Take what you want. Do you want something? Take it. You think that will be good for you? Take it. It will be enjoyable? Take it. Take it what you want. This is the essence of sin. In fact, remember, the very first sin in the garden as the serpent is tempting Eve, and after pulling the temptation, you have she takes of the fruit. The whole idea about sin is that you are taking what you want. And what David does here is he takes Bathsheba that he ought not to yeah, I think it's worth observing here, even at this moment, that this problem of a man using his power against a woman has been a long, long, long problem. It's a sin problem, and it is sinful, but that's what David does. David, as king, is able to do as he wishes. He takes what he wants, and he takes Bathsheba. It is also worth pointing out at the very end of verse 4 why it speaks of this whole purifying from her uncleanness. But the point to be made of why this is noted is to show there's no chance that it belongs, baby belongs to anybody else but David. It must be his child. And so thus it is said why verse 5 that says, she now informs David, I'm pregnant, and there's no alternative. Uriah is in the battlefield. And she has just purified herself, therefore the baby belongs to David. No question about it. The sin then has been fulfilled. If this is not bad enough, it's arguable that the rest is what's worse. 
You know, we have seen that in our society. Sometimes it's not the sin, well, that's bad, but the cover-up that becomes awful. And what we see in David is the say of the cover-up becomes absolutely awful. Verse 6, so David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. I have to think Uriah is going, this is very unusual of you to call me and ask me of all these things. But okay, here's how everything is going. Verse 8, David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house. And there followed him a present from, from the king, but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down into the house, into his house. And when they, when they told David, Uriah didn't go to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths. And my Lord Joab and the servants of the Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and to lie with my life? As you live and as my soul lives, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, remain here today also. Tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained, remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him and ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk, and in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. What you see David attempting to do twice is to cover up his immorality. What I'm going to do is just cover this up. Uriah, come home and I'll send you to be with your wife, and then when this baby is born, nobody will think it's me. We'll all just think it's Uriah's, and so we'll live happily ever after, and nobody will know this sin. And yet, you have God trying to wake David up as Uriah is unwilling to do this. In fact, it is so interesting to see this contrast. David refuses to stop his lust and sleeps with Uriah's wife while Uriah, who's been made drunk by the king, refuses to sleep with his own wife. There is a huge picture of holiness from the Hittite, a greater holiness and a greater concern for God than David who David doesn't see what he's done and doesn't see the holiness of God and Uriah does. Uriah says, the ark is out in battle and my fellow servants and soldiers are out in battle and Joab is out there. The presence of God is out there. We're going to maintain our purity and maintain our holiness. You get a sense if you remember back in 1 Samuel when the priest asked David and his men, have you kept yourselves pure before eating the holy bread? That there was a sense of going into battle. Keep yourself pure. The ark of the covenant is with us. And be holy to the Lord. When your eyes do that. He said, like, how can I possibly go home? God is with us in this battle. And I'm going to remain pure before my God. And so he sleeps there at the palace of the Lord. Rather than going home. If that's not bad enough, it is stunning what happens next. Verse 14 in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And in the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the servants of David among the people fell. 
and Uriah the Hittite also died. What David does to cover up his sin is truly amazing. Absolutely stunning. A horrible, premeditated, murderous plan of David. Put him in the worst position possible. Put him in the worst of the fight and don't support him at all. When the fighting gets fierce, you draw back from him so that he dies. The message is clear. This is not an accident, but clearly telling Joab, this is what I want to have happen. I want him to die. It is important to note, even in verse 17, it points out, Uriah is not the only one who dies because of this plan. Other servants, other soldiers die in the process. Verse 24 says it as well. When Joab sends the message back to David, then the archer shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. An important observation to see here. It's a hard, hard, hard truth. The righteous can be overrun by the sins of the wicked. And God doesn't stop that. What has Uriah done? What have these soldiers of Israel done? but serve their God. Faithfully go out to battle, looking to the Lord for victory. What have these men done? Nothing. And yet because of the sin and the wickedness of David in this moment, the righteous suffer. The righteous die. It is a truth about this world. It is a truth about how things operate. The righteous suffer at the hands of the wicked. And that will happen throughout the history of the scriptures, throughout the history of humanity. Even Jesus himself allows him to, himself to suffer and die at the hands of lawless wicked men. Well, sometimes we have a difficulty with that. How can it be that the righteous suffer at the hands of the wicked? It is something that God allows. And you see it allowed here. It is hard not to be just crushed, to see what has happened to Uriah, to see what has happened to these faithful men in this army, all because David does not want anyone to know about what he's done. Boy, how scary it is to think how far people will go to cover up their sin. Even somebody who you would see as righteous and faithful like David, what he would do to cover up his sin. If that were not bad enough, we're not done yet. Verse 25, David said to the messenger, Thus shall you say to Joab, Do not let this matter displease you. For the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. And he encouraged him. What an answer David gives. Well, you know what? People die in battle. One day one person dies, and another day another person dies. Oh well. And you have him encouraging Joab. Essentially, what David does here is he says, well done, Joab, you've carried out my wishes. And I hope you will think about how these words will come back to haunt David. The sword devours one now and it devours another later. The rest of David's life will be that truth. And the sword will never leave his house because of this choice right here. And while David in this moment is pleased, and he thinks he's gotten away with this, verse 27, 
Now when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But, but please notice this last slide. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. There's a word play that's happening here where David is telling Joab, don't be displeased by what has happened, the death of Uriah and the death of those men. And yet this story wants to end with us hearing, but God is displeased with what David has done. David thinks success. David thinks he's gotten away with it. David thinks cover up complete. That God was displeased by this. The Lord will in this chapter, we'll see God's answer to that. But for the time being tonight, there are three, I think, really crucial, crucial applications that we need to see from the fall of David, the anatomy of a spiritual failure. Number one, we need to see that sin does not just happen. Sin does not just happen. I hope as we go through this event that you see that David crossed so many stop signs, so many red flags, so many opportunities to get out of this situation, but he refused to do it. He inadvertently sees Bathsheba. Opportunity number one, avert your eyes, leave the scene, go back into your palace, and be done with it. He doesn't do that. He instead thinks about it. And now inquires about her. Failure to now asking about her. And where his opportunity to get away from this is again, that is Uriah's wife. That is Iliam's daughter. And he fails to walk away from that opportunity. Not only does he fail then, he shouldn't have had her come to the house and taken her by force. Not only that, he should not have tried to cover it up twice with Uriah by bringing him home or trying to cover it up again by having Uriah killed. He blows through so many warnings and so many stop signs and so many chances to stop and say, don't do what you're doing. And the point that I want us to think about is sometimes we think of sin in terms of, well, it just caught me out of the blue. But more often than not, there were warning signs and stop signs along the way that we ignore to barrel forward with the sin that we want to commit. This is what you see even the Apostle Paul say. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure. it. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There is an opportunity to stop what you're doing. There is a way to put the brakes on. There is a way to say no. There is a way to get yourself out of the circumstance. You don't have to continue down the path of sin that you set yourself on. There's a way to stop. And there were so many opportunities for David. So many opportunities to prevent the death of Uriah. To prevent the adultery with Bathsheba. So many chances. And my first message to you is look for these opportunities to escape. Look for the chances to walk away from sin. When temptation comes, what are you going to do in that moment? What will you do with your mind? What will you do with your opportunity? What will you do with your body? What can you do to avoid the sin? Walk away. 
Change what you're thinking. Change what you're doing. Stop the idleness. Do something different. There are so many opportunities to stop. And so often we look at it as just a quick thing rather than a series of opportunities that we could have escaped the temptation. The anatomy of spiritual failure is not paying attention to the warning signs and not paying attention to the opportunities to get away from a sin. That's number one. Number two, we need to see the scourge of sin. We need to see the scourge of sin. First, we need to see that sin does not just happen, that there are opportunities to get out of it. And second, we need to see the scourge of sin, and it becomes so apparent with David what the scourge of sin ultimately is. You just don't care that you're saved. Were you struck by the brazenness of David? Were you struck by how far he would go? Were you struck by how he was just willing to do whatever it takes? That is the scourge of sin. You don't care about your city. You don't care about who you hurt. You don't care about the implications. You don't care about the consequences. You are going to do what you're going to do, and you don't care about anyone else. That's ultimately what sin is about. That sin is harming others and is a violation of the character of God. And I submit to you, friends, that all hope is lost when we no longer care about what we have done. I think verse 25 is perhaps the scariest verse of the whole account. For the messenger to come to David and say, Uriah is dead and so is some of your army. And David simply says, oh, well, well done, Joab. Wow. That is frightening. Frightening. You had people killed. And you know what you can say is, it happens. Well done. You did your job. And ultimately, what you see in David is he thinks he's going to get away with it, and he's happy because of it. Don't be discouraged, Joab. He encourages Joab. It's good. I've accomplished what I wanted. You've done my will. Friends, we need to see what sin is doing to us, because what sin does is it makes us no longer care about our sin. It's the most dangerous thing about sin is that sin, when it becomes implanted, we do it again and again and again and we don't care that we're doing it. And we don't care who we're going to hurt. And it doesn't matter what it takes to cover it up. We will say and do whatever it takes. It is a huge, huge warning. And this is why it is so important that we know that just because we do not see our own actions as evil doesn't mean that God doesn't see those things as evil. We look at what we've done and go, I did a good job. Cover up success. Sit in the closet. Nobody knows. Nobody sees. Well done. Just because you think you're right with God, that nobody sees your sin doesn't mean that you're right with God and that God doesn't see ourself. It is such a devastating picture and ultimately something that we will spend a lot of time talking about in the next lesson, but let me preview it. The problem's not that we sin. The problem is how we handle our sin. The problem's not that we sin. The problem is what do we do about it? What David does is horrifying. And that's what makes this account so terrible. It is the scourge of sin. You don't care 
who you hurt, and you do not care about your sin. Rather than a more sinning, David needed repentance. But that's not what we see. Which leads into number three. And maybe this is the most important of all of it. Never think this kind of sinning can't happen to us. It's really easy to read these kind of accounts and go, oh, I would never do that. I would never commit adultery or have somebody killed or do these kinds of things. But before we step into that trap, would you ever have imagined from what we have read in regards to David and David's faith and David's humility and David's trust in God and complete dependence upon God that he would ever do something like this? Who would ever think? The first time you would ever read this, this is a blind side. Like, okay, I see the, the woman problem, but all the way to adultery and murder? You may know of people that are friends in your life or of other situations, but there have been plenty, plenty, plenty of faithful people who have fallen into serious devastating sins. And if we ever look at other people and think, I can't believe they did that, I would never do something like that, you are in grave danger. We are to read something like this about David, not as a, oh, I can't believe he did that, but as a huge warning of what can happen to even the most faithful of people. Somebody who is so dependent upon God, and yet, because of not paying attention to the stop signs, and not listening to the warning signs, and seeing the dangers that lie ahead, Look at where David ends up. I read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, about the way of escape. Notice the two verses right before that. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. That's the sentence right before, no temptation is overtaking you, it's not coming in, or God provide a way of escape. Right before he says that, he says, if you think that that won't happen to you, you better watch out. If we think we are so different, or we are so more spiritual, or so more holy than others, that such a thing could never happen to us, the Apostle Paul comes along and says, you better not think that. Friends, every sin we need to be on guard for. Sins that we would think would never be a problem can quickly become a problem. We need to guard ourselves Watch out for every form of evil. Be aware of every temptation. And realize things that maybe in the past we thought we were able to easily set aside. That may not be that easy in the future. Always keep your guard up. Always watch the warning signs. Always run. And do not walk when it comes to temptation. Run, run, run. Because if you believe that you will stay, watch out. You may fall. And if there's anybody in reading this account, I would say certainly would be able to stay. It would have been a person by David. And yet even David, through a series of ordinary circumstances, ends up being so far down the road it's a vulture. Be careful. Watch out. Because Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he will die. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that we would just be so far more aware more and more aware, more cognizant, and just see temptations.
Jesus are coming at us. Lord, we pray that we would be so aware of the attacks that Satan is throwing at us. Lord, we pray that we would just have a far greater wisdom about dealing with temptations as they come. Lord, give us the mental strength. Give us the heart. So that when our minds turn to temptation, that we would reject those things out of our minds. Lord, give us the strength to not entertain our desires, to not think about sinning, but to turn to purity and holiness. Lord, give us the greater strength to make those right decisions. And Lord, forgive us for how often we have not. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we've entertained sin. Forgive us for when we have followed through with our desires. Forgive us for when we've taken what we've wanted. Forgive us when we have ignored your warnings and given us so many opportunities to turn away from sin. Forgive us for refusing to take those chances. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Because it's only because of him. It's only because of his death. Only because of his resurrection. That we can be made clean. Even though we have sinned, for sin upon sin. Thank you for grace upon grace upon every sin that we have committed. Lord, may we be strengthened to reject temptations in the days ahead with a far greater purpose.